Today we're gonna to minister out of seven verses. We're gonna see what life there is in seven verses. Come on, let's go see. So the seven verses I wanna talk about are in John chapter 11. It's a familiar uh, passage of scripture because it's about raising Lazarus from the dead. But I've seen something in the last few weeks that has been uh, incredible, and I've seen God do some mighty things through it. So let's just get into it today. So this is John chapter 11, starting at verse 38. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. You know the story. You've heard it over and over, but recently I've just seen some things in the story that has even brought life and change to my own life. So I want to minister that to you today. First of all, Jesus brought hope. He said, take away the stone. You know, there are things in our lives that, that um, cause stones to <laughs> kind of lay over us and keep us in a tomb or a cave. But Jesus brought hope by saying, take away the stone. We can minister not only to ourselves, but to others as well. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to stay in your sins. You don't have to live with that addiction. Taking away the stone and bringing hope that change can actually come. But then there's always the reaction or the excuse. Martha says, Lord, he's been dead four days. He stinks. Jesus, the resurrection and the life. Jesus, their dear friend, who they know has raised other people from the life, but interesting. The other people were the widow of Nain's son. So that happened, and they're burying him on the same day, so several hours. Then there was Jairus' daughter who had died, and again, that was a several-hour thing. But Lazarus was dead four days. Maybe those other people weren't really dead. They just, you know, had kind of stopped breathing for a while, but they could start again. No, they were dead, but Lazarus is four days. He's in the tomb. He's probably not only stinking, he probably some sort of decay has come in at this point. But we don't have to suffer. We can pull that stone off, not only in our own lives, but speaking words of life to other people as well. Uh, we might say, oh Lord, you know, it happened so long ago, or it really doesn't matter. When you say it doesn't matter, it really does matter or wouldn't be bothering you. So it does matter. So there's always the excuse, and we give this reaction, don't disturb my accepted way of life. I've learned how to live with it. Don't bring hope that something might could happen, but it won't. I can't take that. I'd rather stay dead forever than take a chance that life could come on, come in. But Jesus always comes with life. And not only just life, he comes with it more abundantly. So Jesus said to her, he's building her faith. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And then I love his prayer. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Are you confident like that when you pray that you know that God has heard your prayers? I just love that. This is an interesting thing. I looked this up recently. Obey, the word obey, appears 85 times in the Old Testament, 34 times in the New Testament. But the word believe is only 45 times in the Old Testament, but it is 272 times in the New Testament and 99 times in the book of John alone. Believe. 
Anything that we receive from God is because we believe what he said and we receive it. And so Jesus is building their faith by saying, have I not told you that you would believe in me, that you would see the glory of God? So he's building their faith. And then Jesus brings to life. He says, Lazarus comes forth, come forth. So here comes Lazarus jumping out of the, the cave per se and running. But then he was bound hand and foot and he had a cloth over his face. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. Have we, have we missed something in the aspect that when we get saved, oh great, we have everything we need, you know, everything's been done, but have we come out of the grave alive, but we're still bound hand and foot and have something over our face? Now, just imagine if, if Jesus wouldn't have said that, and so they took Lazarus home with him, they took the mummy home with him, and he's there sitting in the living room and he's all bound hand and feet, that affects what he does, where he goes, he's got the, the uh, grave cloth over his face, it affects what he sees and what he can speak. So he may have been alive, but Martha and Mary in that condition would have not been able to converse with him. They would not have been able for him to go anywhere with him. And he would eventually have died, he eventually would have died twice or the second time, which I think would have been worse than the first death. But Jesus came for him to be alive to be fully alive and to be set free. This is where I'm wanting to minister on this today. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that go to counseling, whether it's pastoral or psychologists or um, whatever, psychiatrists, what's the other one called? Psychologists. Um, and when people go and they talk to them, how many of them have adult issues? Oh, all of them have adult issues, but how many of them started when they were adults? Most of the stuff stems from when they were children. I have come up with this, um, I shouldn't say came up with it, but the thought process and, and what's crossed my mind is that Satan comes into, not into us, we're not possessed, I'm not saying that, but he takes opportunity against us when we're children. Before we have uh, filters up before we have our minds and emotions matured that we can work through things and brings things that happen in our lives. And then that brokenness, that trauma follows that child for the rest of his life. He builds things in his life around that. Um, so, oh, I'm not going to suffer that again, or nobody will ever do that to me again. And so they put up their own physical walls, emotional walls, things that, and so they're not really free. They're not really living. Yes, we are saved, but how many people are still suffering from these things that happened to us in our childhood? The other thing I've noticed is that um, spirits don't come alone. Almost always there's a spirit of fear that is going to attach itself. For example, if a child has been abused or someone's been abused in their lifetime as a young person or younger child, it's amazing to me that then they carry the shame. They were the victim. They did nothing. Someone has perpetrated a crime against them, and yet they carry the shame. They carry the fear that they're going to be found out when they did nothing. They were being an innocent child, and the enemy took advantage of that. And so a spirit of fear then comes along with it. And then, oh, don't forget that a religious spirit then will jump on, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. Oh, you shouldn't have that attitude. Oh, you shouldn't do this. And so we have all these spirits working against us, and we don't realize that we're being now a spiritual victim of what is, may, have, may have happened in the natural. So I believe that God wants to set us free from those things. Um, I, there was a gentleman out of, uh, I believe, Africa, and he was prophetic. His name was Neville Johnson. And he was telling the story about, for about three months, God allowed him to see in the spirit realm. So he could see actual spirits around people and different things like that. And he said, you know, it's a moot point for you to think that the devil can read your mind. He said, because these spirits, when they're, they're on you, are more out. Again, I'm not saying you're possessed. Please do not take that. That's not what I'm saying. But the, that they can affect your lives. And he said he could see a spirit of fear five miles away. 
So that brings you like, wow, wow. So I believe that God wants us to be free, to be able to have life abundantly and to walk in abundance and prosperity. There's even a scripture that I found in Psalms. I read it this week and I was like, wow. It says, he brings out those who are bound into prosperity. Wow. So I love this. And then we have the scripture that talks about in Matthew 18 and also in Matthew 16. Jesus says this twice in Matthew. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's Matthew 18, 18. And then in Matthew 16, he says, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So let me read it to you out of the Amplified Matthew 18, 18. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind, forbid, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, permit, declare lawful on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. I love the Amplified. It just makes the word, expands it, makes it come to um, greater clarity. Um, a few months ago, I, I met with a friend and um, we'd had a time of prayer and I, that season of that meeting was coming to an end. But um, I felt to minister to this person and um, in the process, in the process of our meeting over a year, actually, it had come out some things that had happened in her childhood. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't overt and it wasn't something she talked about all, all the time. You know, sometimes things have happened in people's life that they talk about it all the time. And the truth of the matter is when people are acting out, um, you know, that they're alcoholics or they're drug addicts or they're sex addicts or alternate lifestyles, a lot of this is people that are in pain that they're just acting out, they don't know what else to do, they're in pain. And I think it is our, um, I hate to use the word responsibility, our privilege to set people free, that they're no longer living in pain. And I'm talking about Christians as well as people that aren't saved, because I don't believe that no one in their right mind, right emotions, and, and not being deceived in any way would turn away Jesus Christ. That's crazy. So when you don't, it's because you've been deceived. So we have that privilege to see people being set free. So anyway, so this last meeting I had with her, I just said, I wanna to minister to you and I wanna set you free from things that happened when you were a child. And I wanna pour in the oil and wine of the Holy Spirit, bind up those wounds and pour in the wine uh, oil and wine of the Holy Spirit so that wholeness may come to you and healing may come to you. So I haven't seen her in four or five months, I guess. And we had dinner last night. I was amazed at the transformation. There was such life and vibrancy that was there. And I, the Lord assured me that that was, you know, the word says that he gives signs and, and uh, wonders confirming the word. And so because I knew I was gonna be ministering on this today, I felt that that was signs and wonders confirming to me that it had been done. And so I called her this morning and told her what a testimony it was to me. So let me show you what I've been doing and how this works for me. The word says, uh, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. I bind myself to the love of God because it tells us, I believe it's in 1 John, that perfect love casts out fear. Now, perfect love, I don't have perfect love. God has perfect love toward us. So being bound to his perfect love casts out that spirit of fear. I bind myself to the kingdom of God, which the word says that the kingdom of God is, uh, kingdom goes not, is not food and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy. So I'm binding myself to, the, to those purposes and the things of God that I know that he has for me because I know God wants us to have abundant life. And then I loose myself from anything that the enemy has tried or has or tried to perpetrate in my life.
that I may be free from that. And that oil and wine being pulled, like if he has his claws in me or has caused a wound that's, that has festered for years, I pour in that oil and wine and bind it up by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost that healing and wholeness can come. Let me give you an example. A spirit of rejection, um, something I've been familiar with. Things happened when I was younger in life. And you know, things happen and sometimes it wasn't what we thought, but we interpret it a certain way. And so we, we open the door or give access to the enemy. So a spirit of rejection comes in. Well, then that spirit of rejection causes um, fear to come because you don't wanna be rejected again. But then that spirit is going to continually reinforce itself so that every time somebody doesn't return your phone call, the, that spirit says, see, you're being rejected. Or you hear there was a party that you didn't get invited to. That spirit says, see, you're being rejected. Or somebody looks at you funny. See, you're being rejected. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. So I have learned to begin to recognize the voice of that spirit when he tries to suggest it. And I say, what a lie. I am accepted in the beloved. And so we fight the lies of the enemy with the truth of the word of God. And so I bring that down instead of, in, instead of that spirit being enforced, I say, no, you're not only, I'm not only loose from you and you're going away, I'm not allowing you to put your claws back in me again. And so when it says, uh, uh, you know, oh, you need to be afraid of this. No, I am not going to be afraid for the word says that the, uh, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I know that that's not from God. So one of the things that I'm going to ask as we're going to pray, I'm going to ask the Lord to expose the lies of the enemy. Because I don't know if you're aware of this, but the enemy loves to work in your life under radar. Because he knows if you recognize it and you take authority, the word says that if we resist him, he will flee. So he doesn't have power over us except that we allow it and give it to him. So he knows that when we call his hand, he has to go. And so he's going to work under radar. So have you ever been under uh, attack, per se, spiritual attack, and these things are happening over and over? And you're like, oh, my gosh, it's so much. And then all of a sudden it dawns on you, oh, my gosh, this is just the enemy coming. No way. We're not putting up with this. And, and then we take authority over. But how long has it gone on and on and on? Because we didn't recognize it. So he wants to work under your radar. So there are, I believe, attitudes, thought processes, things that you build up in yourself. For example, a spirit of rejection. You might have uh, entertained a spirit of pride. They can't reject me because I'm too good. Well, see, that's a spirit of pride. And then, so see, another spirit wants to have effect in your life. And then, uh, what does the word say about pride? It says that pride goes before a fall. So you're not setting yourself up to be strengthened. You're setting yourself up for another fall. So when we know the word and we use the word against the enemy, we can see things being changed. And I'm telling you, I know that there's been changes in my life. I know that the word of God is true. Let me read to you, um, you know, the word talks about shalom, which is peace, nothing missing, nothing broken. Let me read to you what Brian Simmons wrote. And Brian Simmons is one of the lead translators for the Passion uh, translation of the Bible. So let me read what he says about shalom. Shalom means much more than peace. It is wholeness, wellness, and well-being. It is safe, happy, and friendly. It is favor and completeness. It means to make peace, to secure, to prosper, to be victorious, and to be content. It is tranquil, quiet, and restful. Um, the pictora, pictographic, sorry, the pictographic symbols for the word shalom are shen, lamed, vav, and mem, which actually reads destroy the authority that binds to chaos. So shalom is used to describe one who has provided all that is needed to be whole and complete and to break off all authority that would attempt to bind us to chaos. That is an awesome thing. So as we're being um, 
things are being bound and loosed. We are being loosed through the shalom peace of God that breaks the authority that binds us to chaos. God wants us free in every way. So I'm gonna pray for you today, and I'm gonna believe that God is gonna bring release in your life, that you're going to be set free, and you're gonna be, as he told, Jesus told the people, loosed and let you go, that you can walk in the fullness of life that Jesus has for you. Father, you are so good to us. Thank you so much for your word, Thank you so much for what Jesus did, that Lord, we can read these stories even 2,000 years later and apply them to our own situation because of the truth and life that is in there. Now, Father, everyone that's listening to me, things may have been brought to their mind, oh, that happened or this happened or whatever. It, it's not a matter that we have to rehash it, but it's the realization of, of what I have built to resist that, but it's a, it's a futile resistance because it's all emotional or human and not the truth and the spirit of the living God. So Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that they would be bound to your love because perfect love casts out fear. There is no place for fear to be working in them. And Lord, we bind them to your kingdom, which is righteousness, peace, and joy that they may walk in the joy of the Lord. And the word says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So then that they are strengthened in that. We ask Holy Spirit that you pour in your oil and wine, you bind up these wounds. You would heal these memories even per se, that the memories, Lord, we, we can't forget things that happen, but the pain that is associated with memories can go. And Lord, we lose them from every attempt of the enemy to hold them captive, to cause trauma and pain in their life, no matter whatever age they are. They could be 90 and something that happened that they remember from five that has affected them for 85 years, they can be set free today. So Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you, thank you that you brought your kingdom and your precious son, Jesus, to work in our lives and to set us free. And so, Father, I thank you today for what you're doing in all the people that are listening. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe God has done something today. I believe that God is going to continue to do things in you. And I would love to hear from you. So send us a line and let us know how God has brought deliverance to you today. God bless you.